Welcome to the People First Podcast. Now, I've got my very good friend here, Victor. Hey, Victor, how are you going? Hey, Shane. Good. Great to be here, my friend. You've Great got a be. radio voice, so I am all over today. I can't wait to listen to this in the car. <laughs> now, guys, I've known Victor for, what, over 12 years. Easy. About 12 years. Oh. Yeah, it would have been, yeah. Well, I've had the facility for 12, and I would have known you for at least a couple contracts at Fitness First. Yeah, that's right. Yes, and yes. Were you Oxygen Days as well? I was there Oxygen Days, I've yeah. I've known you for over fi- over 14 years then. That's because, right. Yeah, I was there for four or five contracts through Fitness First alone, let alone I was there through Oxygen. So that's I've right. done a bit of work in the past. A decade and a half ago. It's a decade and a half. Yeah, that's right. So it has been a while. It has been a while. So I've uh, I've been keen, guys, to have Victor on. Um, he has a beautiful profession. Uh, run us through. What What do you do, Victor? Who are you? What are you about? Yeah. So yeah. So I'm a I'm a naturopath. So I do have a clinic uh, clinic that's locally based in Penrith, which I operate on Saturdays out of um, the Terry White uh, Chemist in Penrith. Uh, it's called the Before Zero Seven Hundred Holistic Health uh, Clinic. So I'm very proud to say that I've had uh, that facility now for well in uh, different uh, under different names but for quite a number of years since 1999 Um, so I do that on Saturdays I also work during the week for a company called Integria Healthcare and I work in both the education and sales department uh, within the retail division so not only promoting uh, supplements but also educating people like pharmacists pharmacy assistants even the general public in regard regards to uh, one of my favourite topics, which is herbal medicine. So it's something which I'm very, well, extremely passionate about. It's something which I utilise um, for my own health and well-being, along with my family's health and well-being, and of course for my patients. So it's, yeah, it's, um, I'm just glad to be in an industry like this that um, I'm working pretty much six, you know, five or six days a week, but loving every single minute of it because I'm helping people. That's. I think that I think when you're in this industry, whether it be personal training, nutrition, whatever it might be, if you don't want to help people as much as you want to help yourself, you you can't be good at your job. Yeah, that's it. That's and right. When I look at you, I see someone who is passionate about what they do and passionate about nutrition, passionate about the planet. Um, because if you don't understand the planet, how can you understand the food that grows on it? Absolutely, absolutely. Herbal medicine is an important and integral part of health for humans and they are a part of the pillars of the foundational healths that we, that we look at and that we've probably grown to, to know about. Exercise, nutrition, hydration, sleep, all that stuff makes up a big network of health. And if you don't have the passion for it, how can you give the passion to your clients who need to be the most passionate because it's their lives that suffer if they don't understand? Well, that's it. Yeah, it's their life, it's their health and... The good thing about herbal medicine, uh, or when it comes to nutrition, it's it is easy to apply. It's easy to apply, and that's the good thing about modern herbal medicine is that mm. we do have methods to be able to administer this sort of stuff that makes it easy. Yeah, beautiful. Now, where did the name Before Zero come from? Oh, Before Zero Seven Hundred. So, um, for many years, I've operated under the name Victor Tabala Natural Therapies, but the Before Zero Seven Hundred. Uh, it's very interesting because it's all about. Um, I guess one of the routines that I do pretty much on a daily basis, so I get up at around you know, roughly 4.45 a.m., obviously most mornings, and that's how I start my day. And um, the, the term before 0700 started because I would be talking to a few of my friends and family and so forth about how I get up in the morning, why I do it, because I do believe that exercising first thing in the morning is paramount in terms of getting the, not only for health, but also getting your, giving yourself a good start to the day, giving yourself the motivation to kick the day forward. And as a result, I've had you know, a couple of, uh, I guess, negative responses to that. Um, a couple of friends, in, or one friend in particular, he used to, um, I guess, um, have pleasure in taking out, taking the mickey out of me by waking up so early, saying that, oh, exercise in the morning is dumb and stupid <laughs> and all that sort of stuff, which doesn't make sense, Not right? So from that, I guess, uh, in a way, it was, uh, I, I guess, a bit of a... Um, uh, not, only, not, not not necessarily a, a comeback or a retaliation, but I thought, you know what, I could use this. Yeah, fuel. So, yeah as fuel. fuel. Yeah, yeah, it's fuel for me. It motivates me. So when people, I guess, challenge me or decide to say that, okay, well, no, this is, it's, it's dumb or silly or whatever it is, I think, oh, no, it's not. 
And so therefore I decided, well, how can I incorporate this into uh, a, a brand new brand, brand or name for my clinic? And I figured, I like okay, it. yeah, so before 0700. So it's me because I, I do, I, I just believe that everything starts before seven o'clock. You get the exercise done, you eat well, uh, you know, like you eat well, you prepare before seven o'clock. It doesn't have to be seven o'clock, but you prepare first thing and then yeah. basically your day is gone, like your day is on its way, like you're... You're on the front foot. I absolutely love that uh, that ethos, so to speak. You know, mm. for me, the quietest part of my mind, uh, and if you follow my story, definitely high anxiety characteristics, yeah. a lot of stuff like that. And I am the most relaxed and comfortable around four four thirty or five a.m. And that's before seven a.m. Yeah. And for me, if I don't get small wins in early, if I don't start stacking my wins early on in the day, yep. my day writes itself off and I end up doing nothing and feeling quite overwhelmed. And it's funny that you think getting up early could overwhelm you. Quite the contrary. Mm. It actually sets you up to stack as many wins as you can. Now, if you think about this, if you're stacking five to six wins every single morning before 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning and everybody else is getting up at 11 or 12, they might only just reach what you've reached before midday. Yeah, that's it. You're like, getting an extra day. Huh, look, it, well, that's the thing. Like, like when I have conversations with some of the guys who I might go for a run with, it's like we might finish our run. Like we might start at, let's say, like we wake up at four, uh, quarter to five and we start the run at 5.30. By 6.30, 6.45, we would have run 10 or 12 Ks. And it's like, guess what? That's 10 or 12 Ks we've done. We've achieved something. Yep. You know, we've achieved something. This is the most important thing we've achieved something that a lot of people haven't achieved we've already yeah like you're stacking the deck already in your favor and that's like, the thing i love that and, and you can have a lot of people listen to this and be quite like dismissive oh well well good for you blah blah but at the same time all we do is we create a group where you can come do that too we started a little thing called a run club yes and it was no club it was just a group of people running in the same direction at this time on a saturday <laughs> it's funny you mention that because i'm actually part of i guess a couple of clubs now as a result of this and this is what i love about the whole before zero seven hundred concept that people who have sort of joined in my journey and now part of the fabric of what I am. So like for example, on a Tuesday morning, I've got a good mate called uh, Will or Will O'Neill, who I run with every Tuesday at 5.30. Thursday mornings now, I run with a good mate of mine called Brad Dewberry, who I've been running with for eight years, seven wow. o'clock. Uh, sorry, not seven o'clock, eight, you know, eight years now, nine years actually, uh, every Thursday at five, from 5.30, give or take a few, give or take a few um, lazy Thursdays. But, <laughs> and then Saturdays now, so Saturdays, we have a, a run club where more men have, um, have joined in. And so basically it's, it's men mainly from my kids, uh, the dads from my kids' schools. So that's from Woolamai and from uh, Montgrove um, Colleges in, um, in, in Penrith. And so we've got a few dads that run every fortnight. Um, I also do every alternate Saturday. I train with a group of men called Solid Men. Oh, um, yeah, um, you might have heard of Solid Men before. Uh, do you know a guy called Cuzon? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. trains here. Yeah. And uh, I've seen him post photos, him and Jeremy. I think you might know Jeremy as well. Jeremy, yeah. Yep. I know them by their nicknames. Like yeah. there's a there's a Hammer, there's Triple N and oh, uh, LMS we. and all these great <laughs> names. But um, yeah, so, so yeah, a group of men, you know, strong in their faith, but also strong in their character, yes. strong in their their determination to keep fit and healthy to be better men better dads and that's what i'm about too because i'm both i mean well i think i'm a man but yeah. <laughs> but also you know like to be a better father as well better husband 100 yeah. percent. and I, you know they say it takes a village to run a family it takes a village to support and you're creating the villages for yourself to give you and those around you the most opportunities for success in yep. life and absolutely then, and we share a lot of characteristics in that. I do that through, you know, CrossFit HF, through the people's gym, hence why we mm. call it the people's gym. Is yep. It's about the people first. And then on top of that, because we do such a great job with people, we can then have enough energy and power within the community to do good. Um, so that's what we look at. Now, I really love all that, Victor, and I love it all, but I really want to get to know how this all begun for you, where it stems from, childhood, what was where was childhood? What was childhood? Who was Victor as a child? Oh, Victor as a child. Gosh, okay. Well, 
I am emigrated. I'm so I was born in the Philippines back in uh, 1973, and I emigrated to Australia uh, in early 1977 with my mother and father. Um, I'm an only child, uh, so it was just the three of us. And look, growing up here was a challenge. But um, you know, one of the things that really, um, when I look back. Um, that in, that I guess inspires me is the fact that my parents took that leap of faith to come across from the Philippines to live in Australia. We had no relatives here. I don't think we had very many friends that we knew of. We knew of a few, but not many. But to come here to a totally new place, to set up shop, to set up life, um, it was a challenge. But um, relatively, I guess, normal type of upbringing. But for me, one of my challenges was... I guess you know, being one of the very few Asian kids in the class. I mean, you look at you, you look back at some of my class photos. I'm pretty much the token Asian kid, mm-hmm. and amongst a lot of Caucasians and European kids and so forth. So, um, yes, I've got to say there were some painful times, challenging times, where I was subjected to a lot of racial taunts and racial uh, vilifications uh, 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 as such. Um, didn't continue on all the way through through um, school. Uh, oh, sorry, through through my younger years at school. I'd had a little bit during high school as well, particularly the first few years. Um, But I guess, you know, I I learnt to um, build up defences as such. Um, Sometimes it led to bullying, and that's when my father got me enrolled in karate to try and help me defend myself just in case. So everything that I could to not only defend myself, but to gain a bit of confidence as well. So, yeah, it was challenging at times, but for the most part, it was relatively, I guess you could say, uneventful and quite normal. What, what, you may have said this, what suburb was this? Oh, so I, so, I, so when I first arrived here, I actually lived in Redfern for about a month. Okay, wow. Yeah, so I was a Redfern boy for about one month. Not that yep. I can recall anything in my, uh, during my time in Redfern, but uh, pretty much after a month, we moved straight to Penrith. Lucky, because so, yeah. th- you could be a South supporter. Oh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you stayed in Redfern, you might have uh, gone another way. Oh, my goodness. There we go. You so, wouldn't have uh, enjoyed the last few years, would you? <laughs> no, exactly. Well, I'm certainly enjoying time now being a Penrith fan, that's for sure. But yep. uh, yeah, so after a month, my, my parents found a home uh, in, in in a flat in Penrith so we, we we lived in a actually a couple of flats over um, I guess a, a two yeah about a two-year period before we set up shop my, my parents bought a house in Emu Plains nice. so we moved into Emu Plains in 1979 and um, my parents still live there um, so um, I went to school there. I went to like to the local schools there, to Emu Plains Public and to Our Lady of the Way uh, before moving on to Dom's, uh, St Dominic's, and then finishing up at uh, Maca- well, what was McCarthy Senior High, which is now Panola. Yep. Um, so that's where I'll, I did my senior high school year. So, yeah, pretty much mainly in Emu Plains but in the Penrith area. So all my growing up, so basically my, my, my young years, my teenage years, we're all here in Penrith. What were your interests as a child? Do you interested in health? Because I know when I was growing up amongst those years, my diet consisted of every fast food imaginable and not a vegetable in sight, <laughs> yeah. which I think taught me a lot about what I know now yeah. because I know how it feels and I know the symptoms of those foods that I can help my friends, family and, and clients. So how was it for you? Did you naturally draw or gravitate towards health and nutrition or was it something that you developed later on? Something I'll develop later on because I'll be extremely honest with you. No, health wasn't, you know, it was something I wasn't drawn to at a young, uh, a young age. It was Ma- all Mars yeah. bars for breakfast. Ah, uh, Mars. B- <laughs> I was a Milky Bar kid. No, I, I, I was a Cocoa Pops kid. I would eat Milo from the spoon. Now, of course, some yes. people might think, oh, no, but Milo's healthy. Uh, well, you know. I mean, it's got, a, it's got a star rating on it that tries to convince you that it is. Have they even got that program anymore? The, you know, the stars they brought out? Like, oh, the star program. As long that's as you right. paid enough money, you would have an extra couple of stars connected to your product. Well, that's it. Yeah. So, so obviously, you know, Milo was always perceived as being healthy. But when you look back and you look at the, the, you know, the actual of content. The sugars yeah. is definitely up there you no know. but i was one of those kids that would get the spoon and eat you know eat, eat it by the mouthful i would yep. eat nutri grain so all these things look i wouldn't even eat them because of health i just ate them because they tasted good but yep. um yeah no certainly um i also coming to australia um i got to know a lot of these foods that i never experienced in the philippines so things like hot chips yeah. pizzas burgers a lot of that stuff I never grew up with, like in my three years in the, like my first three years in the Philippines. So, for me, it was like, wow, 
you know, all this stuff, you know. My first lasagna was, like, um, uh, um, amazing, you know. But I never, yeah, looking back, no, I wasn't really a big vegetable fan at all, you know. Like, I look I look now into the traditional vegetables that they eat in the Philippines and I certainly embrace that sort of stuff now. But back then, you know, like when mum and dad would cook me a traditional Filipino meal, I'd sometimes balk at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when it, if it was deep fried and full of fat, absolutely nice, you know. Fat, sugar, <laughs> and, and carbs. Of course, mm. And rice, yep. rice, like rice every meal, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Yep. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting that where, where we end up, hey, like when we look back at it where we were as kids and where we eventuated in the paths that we walked down and you yeah. know, there's a lot of pain in learning and I learned that, you know, if I want to continue with extreme difficulty with my digestion and health and skin and weight gain and muscle gain that I needed to at some point apply some principles from my nutrition and not just eat blindly because of taste. That's right. Because yeah. if that was the ca- case, I just eat cinnamon donuts every meal. <laughs> yeah, I was solely I was solely guided by taste in my young years. So, moving, what was your first, what sort of jobs did you have after leaving high, you know high school after because you're Panola, so to speak. Yeah. After leaving that, what did you go to uni? Did you finish? What did you do there? Yeah. So so after I finished, so that you know after it was something you know. Obviously, when you're in year twelve, you start to look at all the career paths you could uh, that you could choose from, or university courses. So I was sort of looking at things like chemical engineering or bachelor of music, those sorts of things, because they were some of the subjects that kind of interested me. Um, I was interested in health as well, and in fact, it was actually when I was reading through um, a, a university courses guide that I came across this thing called naturopathy, which I'd never heard of before. So I was reading through the the, the, the subject, uh, the subject matter, and and looking at it, so yeah, looking at you know, health through various methods such as diet, lifestyle. Mm-hmm herbal supplements, herbal medicine, nutritional supplements. I thought, this sounds pretty good. Um, but never really took it seriously until um, an opportunity came up um, where there was actually a, a college, a professional college in uh, in Sydney that um, that uh, provided the course, so this institution, uh, Australasian College of Natural Therapies. Mm-hmm. So I made the decision to, to pursue that. Um, I did get into, um, I got into UTS in terms of like uh, with a, uh, for a Bachelor of Science Education, yeah, wow. um, which I was keen about, but I thought, you know what, and this is something for me that I guess at that time, this is sort of like one of those first moments where I wanted to really step outside the box. And embrace this. Something about it, like I, I don't know what it was, but you know, it was a it was an unknown quantity at the time. Naturopathy. None of my friends, certainly most of my friends, when I said, "Oh, I'm doing naturopathy," they said, "Oh, what the hell's that?" Yeah. You know? So it was a, a you know certainly an unknown thing back 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 in those like back in the very early nineties. Yep. Um, but yeah, I well, went to funny, funny enough. So, so was personal training. No one knew what it like. Only the rich and famous had personal trainers. Oh, that's yeah, exactly. In the early nights, you, unless you were absolutely living in Mossman or something like that, you want you didn't have your own trainer. Yeah, and you definitely didn't do group exercise unless you were doing lycra in the middle of you know Oz aerobics sort of style. Oh, aerobics Oz style. Yeah, I remember that. No <laughs> group. It's amazing how time is changing, how quickly. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's that, that's right. So I said, you know, I, I'll I will. I wanted to do this course and, um, you know, fast forward now, it's something, you know, one of my, one of the best ever decisions I ever made. Um, but, you know, apart from studying, I was also working. It's funny because I was studying naturopathy, but one of my part-time jobs or one of my casual jobs was um, food delivery, working for the local Chinese restaurant uh. and delivering Chinese food to the Penrith area. So I did that for a few years and then uh, worked in their restaurants as well as a waiter. And then um, I then dabbled in the uh, hospitality industry. So a friend of mine um, told me of an opening um, in a hotel in Sydney called the Farama Hotel. And um, yeah, um, the concierge there, who I'm still great friends with today, Robert Connell. Good day, mate. Um, <laughs> he uh, took me on board as a um, as a as a porter. So one of my first jobs was to carry bags for people, and for me it was amazing because you got to meet a lot of people, obviously, but also the tips. Yeah. So the bags you carry, and then you know the the tourists would give you a tip every time you carry a bag for them. So I would find myself, apart from earning what was a 
pretty decent hourly uh, wage at the time. I was also getting extra tips that would pay for my train travel and for my lunch. Yeah, it was all great. I think I'd be a great concierge or bit like or a porter. I'd be. I'd love that stuff. I love talking to people and finding yeah. out about what they're it was up to. Fun. It was fun. Like, <laughs> or the I'm stories. just nosy. One of the two. I'm just nosy and good yeah. at being nosy. Oh, look! It was it was the stories that you that, that you hear from guests as well, and you got to meet a few celebrities during that time as well. I remember meeting Chrissy Amphlett from the from the Divinals. I yep. had a bit of a chat with her. I, I, I recall um, there was um, some boy band called. I mean, some of the some of my friends that sort of grew up in the nineties would know this band. I think EYC they were called. Okay. My very first day, I don't even remember because my very first day they were staying there. So it's like, um, but yeah, they um, they were there. So um, yeah, it was, uh, and I actually ended up staying in hospitality for a good five years. Even after I'd graduated from naturopathy, I decided to stick to hospitality for a bit and um, they gave me a full-time role in uh, in trainee management so I did that um, but yeah after about five years of being there I honestly decided to you know I thought to myself my parents forked out a lot of money for me to be a you know to be a naturopath I'm now I've now graduated I need to utilize this so yeah um, so my very first job then as a naturopath was actually working in the local health food shop in Penrith. So in Penrith Plaza, there was a health food shop called Russell's. Uh, I started working there just before Christmas in 98 yep. and uh, was there till about uh, the year 2000. So, um, yeah, that's my, I guess my, my first experience as a professional naturopath was on the floor, helping customers. And it's basically where I got to learn a lot more, uh, you know, beyond um, what I learned in college about about herbs and vitamins and supplements because I found out the hard way that there's a lot of things out there that's not not necessarily covered. I remember someone said to me, oh, what's glucosamine? And I said to myself, well, what is glucosamine? Never heard of that before. Start doing your research, <laughs> find did. that there's some holes in some stuff. There's some holes, yeah. Well, that's it because all these all, – all, all, all these ingredients and supplements that I'd never heard of before. So it forced me to, and thank goodness for the internet, because it was only sort of emerging around that yeah. time, right? So yeah, thankfully it allowed me to, to, to do a bit more extra research about some of these uh, new new ingredients, new supplements that I'd never learned about or never studied. Mm. So it was a big learning curve for me, and it certainly fortified the knowledge that I, the knowledge base that I already had. Um, particularly as I was also at that time considering um, doing practice part time, and it was in yeah, um, oh sorry, the <laughs> uh, mid 1999 when I decided to um, start my practice, uh, my part time practice, which today is still going one yep. day a week <laughs> over in uh, over in Penrith. So um, yeah, so a local. Um, uh, a local acupuncture and um, Chinese medicine clinic took me on board, the East West Traditional Medicine Centre. I think I went there once. Was that mm, not not far off High Street? Yeah, yeah, around yeah. the corner there. Yeah, around the corner there. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so so um, so yeah, so they've been there for a number of years, and they um, uh, we 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 got chatting, and uh, they, so they gave me um, you know they they gave me a room for me to practice in one day a week, and uh, yeah, so that's how it all started in terms of my practice, which is still going today. Now I always find that. Through good people and good businesses, there's been something that's made them really good at what they do. For example, I learned the hard way about living a life that didn't give to you, living a life of, you know, I grew up in a family where there was more drugs, less nutrition, um, psychological stuff happening, you know, mental illness, yeah. all that sort of stuff was there. So I learned a lot and I think I've done a lot of my growing and developing into the person that I am today because of all that. So I went through some trauma, so to speak, to get to where I've got to get to. Yep. I believe that every good person and every, behind everyone really, but pushes in the direction they are pushing in, especially in these sorts of industries, is because of something that's happened. And, and we want to talk about the people's journey and the, the people's podcast is about getting in depth with stuff like that. Along the lines, Victor, where would you suggest your biggest challenge has come from and how's it come full circle for you? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Shane. And um, look, for me, my biggest challenge, and um, you know, this is probably going to be a little bit emotional for me, it's actually uh, this week, um, 18 years ago, um, where my first wife, Gay, uh, she passed away. 
Um, and um, so she passed away March 30th, uh, 2005. And um, so obviously it's it's a... Um, it's something which obviously I've, I've, I'm still in, you know, still in mourning for. And every year this comes up, and obviously you sort of, you know, take some time to yourself and reflect. But I think what was the, the 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 challenging part about this, and probably the saddest part about this, is the fact that when she passed away, she was pregnant, and so um, she had a, she had passed away, and so the doctors at the hospital at Nepean, who were fantastic, by the way. Um, tried valiantly to save my son. Uh, so my son, Victor Jr., or Victor Jordan, his name is, uh, he was born that same, that, that same day on March 30th, 2005. Um, so getting through that initial shock and grief was, was tough enough. But for me, there was two things. Number one, one of the biggest ever, or one of the hardest things I ever had to do was to tell our daughter, Alana, who was six at the time, and she was at school when this happened, mm. um, to tell her. That was, I guess, one of the most um, emotional and hardest things I ever had to do was to tell her that her mother had passed away. So that was sort of three or four o'clock in the afternoon that, that, that day. I was then also getting news about my son, who was in an incubator. Um, obviously, the doctors were trying valiantly to, to save him. How far um, how far along was Gay at the time? She was six months. So 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 yeah. So he was um, so he was born yeah three months premature. He I think his due date was about the twenty fourth of June. I think it was mm-hmm. for the, in two thousand and five. So he was he was he was born six months premature. And um, I mean look you to see him there in that incubator, you know, with with every single cord and hose you could think of attached to him, it was so um, gut-wrenching. I mean, a lot of friends and family came to the hospital once they found out, and um, the local parish priest came and baptised him, which was wonderful. So the priest made himself available to to, to baptise him, which was great. And it was just touch and go for that 24 hours. So apart from still reeling about the news about, about gay, I had to sort of be strong for Alana, and, and, and the fact that my baby was still, um, there was still a chance. Unfortunately, um, the doctor took me aside that night and basically said to me that even if he was to survive, he would be facing a life, lifelong um, issues. So disability, wheelchair, mm. no speech. Can, I, was, can I ask, how, how did Gay pass? So she had a condition. Now, this was diagnosed... Um, roughly about, I guess, three three months later, or three months later, it was called peripartum cardiomyopathy. So basically, her heart stopped, and it was due to, in some lengths, to the pregnancy. So peripartum, mean, you know, or, yeah, peripartum means, um, you know, post-pregnancy. So something within the pregnancy had affected her heart. Now we weren't aware of any particular um, heart condition that she had. There was some heart disease in the family, but nothing that was significant or specific. So, unfortunately, that was the 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 um, that was the um, the cause of death. But unfortunately, there was still no actual link as to why that was the case. But it was basically suggested that it was something in the pregnancy that caused her heart to stop. Um, so, yeah, it is something which you know does. You know, it's one of those unanswered questions that I'll never get an answer for. And, you know, one of my fears of that, of course, is, is this something that my daughter Alana would have? And, you know, hopefully, I mean, she's great. Like, she's 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 healthy and, um, you know, like, she doesn't have any particular complications of that nature. So, um, yeah, so that was hard to take. I mean, it was, I guess, in a way, somewhat of a relief to know what it was. But at the same time, it was still a lot of unanswered questions. So... Yeah, and then unfortunately, um, on the thirty first of March, when um, so um, the next day, um, the doctors again took me aside, and I had my my mother and father, and um, my good mate Grant was there at the um, by my side at the time, and um, and also my uh, my other good friend Katrina. Um, basically, the doctor said to me that nothing has changed at all so it became a decision that I had to make about whether we continue or we turn off his his life support 
So I didn't want to see him suffer anymore um, because he... Just that he would have been 18 this year, that's all. He would have been 18. I mean, I, I think about it now, it's like far out. He would have been 18 years old. But oh, probably for a good thing because of the fact that he, he, would, have lived, he would have been living a, a, a life of pain and suffering. And I didn't want him to go through that. So I made that decision to, um, to turn off his life support. And the good thing is, is that we all got cuddles with him, um, which was great. And the other good thing was that he was able to um, be buried with his mother mm. in the same coffin. So yeah, it's hard, and and being <laughs> the day of is is never going to be easy to talk about. And I don't could imagine at any point in the next fifty years it being anything for you and easy for you to speak about. And I appreciate you sharing so much of that, Victor. Oh, look, it's no problem. I mean, look, the thing is, the thing for me is that I I have to move on. You know, I may not move on from this, but I've got to move on because I've got so much more uh, to live for. That's what, I, that's what I said to myself back then. You know, I had my daughter, Alana, like she was only six at the time. Yeah. You know, so she, she was only six and um, this was a... Oh, you know, it's an understatement, but it was a lot for her to take as a as a six year old. Um, so I had to live for her, and so I had to move on. I had to fight. I had to, you know, and yeah, like for me, it was a combination of friends and family. Um, I admit, at that time, my faith was challenged as well because you know it's like, why God? Why? Like, why? Why? Why gay? Like, what? What did she do? Like, what? You know. She didn't do anything. Like, well, what, what did she do to deserve like, VJ? What did he do to deserve this? Um, you know, and it took a lot of soul searching over, you know, a, a, a long period of time to, I guess, regain my faith and the fact that, um, you know, there is salvation in prayer and that's what I took to heart. And look, thank goodness I had not only that, but also the support of my family and friends that would really. Um, inspire me encourage me to to keep going forward and yeah it was look one of the other other things as well and um i hope you don't mind me you know talking about this and in terms of challenges but the other challenge and this kind of happened pretty much a few months well actually about six months after so six months after um gay passed away i decided to go back to go back to the philippines so i could um, see her family because obviously I hadn't had a chance to to uh, to see a lot of them. Um, Gay's sisters, um, May and Annette, did fly over for the funeral, and uh, we got to spend some time together. And um, but I never got to speak to um, my my in laws. So the trip was basically to go there and um, commemorate her six month anniversary, see her family, um, see friends and family. But, and this is another challenge as well that I want to bring up because as an atropath, like you would expect, I'd be looking after myself, right? I'd be, I'd be, you know, a picture of health. That wasn't me. Um, like even prior to 2005, I was sort of up and down with my health. I was just sort of taking it for granted. So my weight had fluctuated quite a bit. Um, in 2000, I could have been diagnosed as a as a type 2 diabetic because my fasting blood sugar was 9 or 8.9. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I only found out found out at a, at a pharmacy where who was doing free testing and she said to me, have you eaten? And I said, yes, but I, I, I knew I hadn't. Yeah. I just wanted to say yes, but I held that to myself. And so I knew that if I'd gone to the doctor, I would have been diagnosed with type, type 2, 2 diabetes. diabetes. Yeah. So my weight had fluctuated. And anyway, um, I was in the Philippines for that six-month commemoration and – what was really hurtful, shocking, was that uh, some of my family and friends, when I got there, they didn't give me a cuddle or a hug and say, "Look, I'm sorry for your loss, for for, for your loss for for Gay and your son." The first thing that they told me was, "You're fat, like you're fat, like," and that really <laughs> it pissed me off because basically, you know. It's like okay, I'm already down in the I'm already down in the gutter. Who needs another kick in the guts? I'm on, another kick in the guts. I was already at my lowest ebb of my life. 
I mean, and this is what this is what you have to say to me for the first time after this event, like really. So, and it was tough because I was made to sit at dinner with some of these guys and they just kept on, you know, nibbling, oh, going on saying, oh, geez, he's so dabat. So dabat means fat in Tagalog in the Philippines. Mm. And I can hear them. I, 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 look, I'm not the best in Tagalog because when I came to Australia, my parents made the decision to speak to me in English so I could mingle right. and you know, blend in with the crowd, so to speak. Mm. So my Tagalog hasn't always been the best, but I can understand some and that was the thing. I could hear their conversation in the Tagalog and they were saying, you know, my nickname at, you know, in the Philippines is Fuji. So I get called Fuji here now as well. So saying, oh, Fuji, the button and the man, you know, all this sort of stuff. And, and it's like, yeah, thanks. Like, and I wanted to say stuff, but obviously with my mother being there, I didn't. But I ended up leaving the conversation. So the thing was, I got back I mean, to for, Australia. For yeah. context, I mean, how heavy were you at the time? You know, like... Well, at that time, look, my heaviest I ever got to was just short of a hundred. I was ninety nine kilos, but I'm only I'm only one hundred and seventy eight centimeters. So you know, so that was quite heavy. Um, I never quite got to a hundred. I think I might have at some stage, but I didn't probably weigh it in. Um, but that was around sort of the late nineties. When I went to the Philippines, I think I was about eighty eight, eighty nine kilos. So I was still pretty. Not 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 over. No, I mean, like not obese, but certainly like, overweight. Not enough for them to l- lose focus of the real reason you're there and pick on you for yeah, a, like what a handful of kilos really. When you think about it, hand kilos of fat, that's about all it was. That's all it was, and and that's why like because wow, it's a thing over there that unfortunately, you know, when you go to the Philippines, sometimes your weight is a topic of conversation. Sounds and like it's something, it. yeah, uh, it's uh, over death and everything else. Over death, it's like no, no, but what? But weight's more important. So it's, it was really distressing when I got this. So I said to myself when I got back to Australia, um, I, 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 I said to myself, I'll, I'll fucking show them. <laughs> I did. That's what I said to myself. I'm going to fucking show these guys that um, that um, that um, you they know they this is not one, right? Yeah. They haven't won. So and although speak. you don't need to prove anything to anyone, it was like, I'm going to use this as fuel, so to speak. Yeah, right? that's right. So that's when I then launched into a whole new regime for myself, training, exercise, watching my diet. Um, so I started to, you know, to, to, to do, you know, um, steady state exercise, like running or walking on the treadmill, cycling, um, you know, trying out of, you know, like obviously doing a, a weights program. I think you might have even put me on a, one of those weight programs. Mm. Maybe I'm just thinking from memory, but... Yeah, one, you, I was uh, the, one of the floor, had four people on the, the oxygen floor and the fitness first floor, so I probably would have definitely... Yeah, you would have advised me. I, I've got a feeling you did. I think it was you, actually. I'm, pre- so. I'm pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's, I think, how we became friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so so it was you and I think um, Chris was another guy. Chris yeah, you remember Cardozo, Chris? Yeah, yep. Chris Cardozo. Yeah, yep. so... so And actually, um, yeah, I've got, to, I've got to mention this because it was... So as I was, I guess, getting fitter and getting healthier... I decided to want to challenge myself in a few different things. So one of my very first challenges was to survive Chris Cardozo's boxing class. Yeah, that was uh, notorious in, notorious, the, in the day. Yeah, yeah back in the day, it was quite notorious. And um, so I'd heard about his classes. <laughs> um, so I said to myself, okay, I'm going to give this a go. And uh, yeah, um, I ended up going to his class at least once or twice a week. I think from memory as a trainer moving into a space that uh, you know, it was my first day on, on shift and Glenn, the manager at the time, was like, you know, I remember Glenn, yeah. Yeah, you go know, the, the sort of the goat around here is Chris and his boxing class, watch the people <laughs> flock. And you, and guess what? He's stepping away a little bit from that. You're going to take over a few classes. And I'm like, I've never done that before. Yeah. The cold faces I got taking over a class or filling in when I had to from people going, who is this guy <laughs> taking our goat's class? Yeah. Oh man, I'll never forget the intimidation. I walked in there shaking in my boots, trying yeah. to tell people I knew what I was doing. I was a young trainer, barely sixty nine kilos of you know ring and wet. Because no <laughs> one took me seriously. I mean, people take me seriously now because I've done it for fifteen years and, and put on some muscle. Yeah. But at the time, I had nothing. You know, I was more of a sport guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. man, intimidation to the to the max, and that would have been a challenge for you. That would have been like, I'm gonna do that and get through the full thing. Yeah. Because he used to crush people like that. It was awesome. Oh, he did. I like, loved and, watching it. And, 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 and it was also the very first time I was introduced to the dreaded burpee. 
<laughs> never heard of the burpees before. And so when he said, right, get down 10 burpees, I'm like, what the hell's a burpee? <laughs> and it's it's like, it's it's hell on two legs and two arms, yeah. I, I tell you. But uh, obviously it's something which I do embrace as part of my my, my training these days. Um, but yeah, it's it still sucks. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, um, so it was those little little challenges that I wanted to challenge myself with, you know, give myself a renewed focus on my life and my health, and uh, that's the thing. So from there, as as my weight started to improve, reduce, and my fitness was improving over the years, I I decided to challenge myself with other activities. So one of the challenges I I wanted to challenge myself to was to do um, long distance running. Because I was never a runner as a kid, okay? I used to barely finish the three-kilometre um, cross-country cross country at St. Dom's when I was there. So I was always one of the stragglers behind, you know? Yep. My time was terrible. But um, I found that when I started to do steady, you know, like steady state running and, and so forth, I, I could, you know, last for the three Ks because that was my first thing I wanted to do. Can I run three Ks? Um because that was the distance that I struggled to finish at school. So, yeah, three became five, and then five became six, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, it came to my mind that, okay, maybe I can run 10. And then from there, it's like, okay, well, what's a good event? So City to Surf came up as an event. That 14 k 14 k So I did that in 2011 for the first time and nice. got through it at a pretty good time, I've got to say. I think it was an hour 11. Nice work. Yeah, I was happy about that. Um, but also, one of the other... Things I got to 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 um, um, I guess immerse myself into was the area of obstacle racing. Yep. So that for me was Spartan races. Spartan tough race. Bloke. Tough bloke. Tough bloke. Tough mutter. Um, Kept up with your resume of training, don't you? I've been watching. Oh, you've been watching, yeah. So, so there was a so the very first event I did was Tough Bloke Challenge in um, at Appen at the um, exact cataract. same one. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the Cataract Scout Park. Yep. I got photos covered in mud. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, mud was least of our worries. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I did that. That was my very first race, and then for me, it was all like keenly looking for the next race. So then, you know, uh, the, the the one that came up after that was um, uh, Tough Mudder. Which I did. That was that seven or oh, nineteen kilometres of hell uh, yep. they call it over at uh, Glenworth Valley. Yep. And then Spartan Race came along and added a new challenge. And like to this day now, that's one of my favourite events that I like to attend to every year. So now I, I try and attempt the Spartan Trifecta. So the you know like you've got three races: the Spartan uh, Sprint, which is five k, Spartan. Super, which is 10, and then the Spartan Beast, which is 21. And the idea is you've got to complete all three within a year. But the extra challenge is if you can go to a Spartan weekend, you do all three in that weekend. Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Oh, wow, that's intense. Yeah. So I've done that. So I, I've done four Spartan trifectas, but my very first Spartan weekend was last year. So I did it with a couple of mates, Rich and Jay, and we got through it. So, um, But, yeah, it was those sorts of things that as I found myself improving in my health um, I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to, you know, go beyond the fact that I could now finish a three-kilometre run that I couldn't do back at high school. Yep. And that, for me, is something which I, I like to, uh, I guess, live my life to, always finding a new challenge. It doesn't have to be a race. It can be, it can be you know, a, 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 new, a new skill. Or a, you know, like that's why I decided to do uh, up, update my skills and um that's why now i'm almost finished i've just about finished my bachelor of education oh sorry of exercise and sports science um in june so i wanted to just just keep learning and and keep adding to my skill set so um but yeah just keep on challenging myself so that's something which i'm really happy for and with all these challenges you're exercising so you get the added benefit of wow you know you, you get to manage your weight you don't have any particular issues with chronic disease as well. Like my, my I don't have. I mean, my my my, my blood sugar sits at four point nine now, which is which is great. Yeah, my cholesterol's fine. My blood pressure for an almost fifty year old is okay. So I'm happy uh, with my with my health in general. Just a few little little niggling injuries, you know, you know, tight hamstrings and uh, plantar fasciitis. Body, yeah, the human body in a sitting down a lot of the time for our works and driving and. You know, recreation, a lot of that stuff outside yeah. of, you know, exercise is quite bad for the body, so to speak. Yeah. You know, as humans, are not really designed to sit still. No. You know, we're able to move around for long hours at a time. But the way right. we're designed, we're able to walk for, you know, days if needed. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, you know, us sitting in one spot for eight hours a day or five hours a day or three is very, very taxing on the human body. And that's not to mention, like, we don't ever 
fully pay attention when we move our bodies. Sometimes, you know, when we're playing sports, you know, I'm about to, well, got my first game of soccer today. I ain't thinking about correct movement. I'm thinking about getting a goal and that's it. So that's going to come at a cost <laughs> yes. of my hamstrings, my calves. That's it. You know? Yeah, that's right. My hips, it's going to, they're going to feel that tomorrow. Don't you worry. Well, that's right. And, and as a, and as a budding sports scientist, that's what I look at now. I look at not just the end result, but it's like, well, how am I going to get there? And can I get through that without, without injuring myself? You know? Yep. 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 <laughs> yeah. And so I, I wanted to, I wanted to go back a little bit, um, and not not to bring up to make to you know, to bring up fresh memories again. Sure, but sure. There are people out there that are listening that are going through trauma similar to you. And there's no rating on trauma. You don't rate a ten and they rate a one. Trauma in my eyes is trauma. Mm-hmm. What principles, routines, what did you do to help you move forward, like you said? You said, you know, you had a little girl who was six, and I can't I mean, I get teary thinking about having to even tell Quinn that she can't go to the park, God's sake, let alone her mother not coming home. Yeah. How did you help yourself move forward? What routines? Training was a big one. Yeah. Where else did you go? Because I know I've done some stuff in my life that's caused some trauma. I've then tried to journal, meditate. I've tried to add nutrition in. It works but it's hard. Mm -hmm. And people listening who don't feel ready yet, but are going to listen, hear you and go, I'm not ready yet, but I'll try that when I am. Yeah. What words of advice do you have around that for them? Well, the thing is the, the best piece of advice um, is that don't feel that you're alone. Mm -hmm. Seek it, seek help, whether it's from um, in a professional sense. So for me, one of the things I did was, um, and actually it was great because one of the services that was offered to me was um, counselling services from the um, um, from the local council. So that was offered to me and to Alana. So we, you know, we obviously took that on board and we went, you know, to, to sessions weekly or actually every fortnight from memory. Um, speaking to people. I mean, fam- not just family, but friends. Except if they're in the Philippines. Except there, yeah, exactly. Oh no, no. Well, that's the well. That was the thing. Like, like when I when when I went there, there obviously there were there were family and friends that were caring Support, and yeah, exactly. supportive yeah. and didn't even. Give and it's a, funny you could yeah. have you could have ten, fifteen family members that are there supporting you, and then one say like Uncle Barry go, hold on, <laughs> you're looking fat, and then that's like what like and that yeah. just throws you, and that's that's life though. Yeah, because you can tell everyone that like I know people who have such amazing things going for them and they have one person say something to them and it ring and unravels them like a yeah. thread pulls them apart yeah that's it and 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 for me i look back and while, whilst i can go back to that and think about how how pissed off i was i guess for me it was like okay well it was like a turning point so mm. i look back now and it's like well maybe in some level i should be thanking these people i guess yeah, it's a gift <laughs> it's a gift right like yep. it, yes it is a kick in the ass to, to keep you going but at the same time it's like well Thank maybe yep. maybe maybe it was i don't know the universe or god's way of telling you you know what this is a, i'm going to have to give it give it to you this way because i can't give it to any other in any in any way else so but yeah, maybe that. Um, yeah, but you know, seeking, you know, obviously getting, getting, uh, seeking out um, close friends and family. I mean, like, particularly in my in my circle at the time, and particularly at the gym when I was training and uh, 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 as well. Um, so many people would always be willing to to help. Um, the school, Alana's school, were fantastic. I mean, they raised money for for Alana so that her schooling fees would be taken care of for the rest of her schooling schooling life at yeah, the wow. at the school. So they held a, a a gala night for her, and for the first, I think, few months, you know, they uh, a family would bring food to our place. So nice. uh, yeah, it was it was so good, and I continued to to uh, maintain friendships with some of these people uh, as as well. I guess I just had to immerse myself and not hide anything you know just basically be real and i think for that they returned it by you know offering advice shoulder the cry on and that and that 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 too that too kept me going that just it just really it really kept me going and i guess you know that led to over the year regaining my confidence as as well and um I guess, you know, a, a highlights for me, particularly after a year, uh, after it happened, uh, not long after a year about that, is um, I, I met someone. I, I, I was introduced to um, 
So uh, family, mutual family friends, uh, mutual friends uh, introduced to um, a lovely lady at a local, uh, at, at, at what is now my, my daughter's uh, school, Montgrove. Um, yeah, a, a school teacher there. Um, so um, she was teaching this friend of mine's kids and um, she'd asked me actually at, um, at a mutual, another mutual friend's baptism. She said to me, this is probably about, May, I think it was, May, late May or early June, maybe May of 2006, so it was over a year after, she just said to me, you know, and she she, she didn't know how to ask me, but she said to me, you know, I don't, I don't know if you are, but are you considering meeting someone again or dating someone again? And I said to her, yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it, I guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had, you know, I had spoken to um, a few, you know, a, a couple of um you uh, you know couple couple of women before that, but um, nothing really eventuated. Um, and I said, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. And she said, good because I've got someone for you to meet. And um, yeah, so it was a it was a date, a blind date at um, what was the um, Cottage Lane Cafe in uh, High Street there, uh, where I came acro- uh, where I met. Um, uh, the beautiful Sarah Bates, uh, mm. <laughs> who's now my wife. So we met, and um, yeah, obviously our feelings, you know, feelings developed over time. And um, I asked her to marry marry her a year later. Um, and I think, I mean, but before that, it was great because she was fully aware of what happened, mm. and it didn't scare her off. Yeah. I mean, that was my 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 concern. That particularly as I really started to develop feelings for her. Yep. That. I was just concerned that maybe is a, is she is she okay with this? Is she okay to be yep. not only me who's you know going through this, but also to take on uh, a now seven or eight year old um, girl as well? And yeah, and there are people out there who just aren't emotionally developed enough as people to take on responsibility because it can be slightly a responsibility. You know, you yeah. you know that there is you're not going. You're not going into life this way. You're coming into life this way. Yeah. And how do we navigate the obvious things that may or may not come up? Uh, and what do we do to build good quality foundations in our family? Yeah. And that's that's a challenge for some people. So Sarah being who she is yeah, was able to take all of that on and not in a bad way, but embrace and create from that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly it. Like she did. Like she literally embraced the whole thing. And, you know, she went through the ups and downs, you know, um, that I was going through and what Alana was going through. And she stood by us. And, um, yeah, so, you know, those those feelings turned into um, a deep love um, that uh, emerged. And I asked her to marry me a year later after we first met. Um, and uh, we ended up getting married in uh, October 4th. There you go. I know the date, <laughs> October fourth. Good Two- month to be married in. Yeah, yeah, two thousand and eight. It was so. Um, yeah, and you know now we have three beautiful kids of our own: um, Charlotte, who's thirteen; Alex, who's ten; and Felicity, who's seven. So wow. yeah, along with Alana, who's now twenty four. And I got to, I got to say, I'm so proud of Alana. Like she is, um, such a strong girl. Um, and you know it's it, it makes me proud of what she's achieved. I mean, you know, some might say she's followed in my footsteps, but um, it was all her choice. So she decided to, when she finished uni- uh, finished high school, to do a um, nutritional science degree over in the Uni of Wollongong, and she finished that. Um, and then she decided to um, expand her um, her area of uh, knowledge, and she decided to do a master's of nutrition and dietetic, which uh, dietetics, which I'm pleased to say she's about to complete. Uh, I think it's May this year. Yeah, May wow. T- yeah, so yeah, she's going to be a little bit more qualified than me in nutrition, I think. Yeah. <laughs> as a result, she'll, she, she, she's <laughs> smart. She'll let you know it. She'll oh, tell yeah. you at every moment. <laughs> oh, she tells me. And you know what? The thing is, we do share a lot of things in common in that regard. That we do have our little, you know. Small deba- friendly debates about a few things. It's important. But, it's yeah. important because people aren't all the same. And I think it's, uh, you know, you get this one, uh, what I hate is a narrow-minded anything. Like, yeah. like, this is the way I learn it, so it has to be right. Well, no, that's the yeah. way you learn it and you've applied it, but it may not be right in yeah. these circumstances. Yeah, exactly. And that's how, you know, like, like, like for me, one of my influences with my, with, with, during my career is, you know, meeting up with doctors who are openly embracing every aspect of what we do yes. as naturopaths. So it's all about health, well-being, mm-hmm. movement, lifestyle, diet, 
Because as we know, and even doctors will verify this, you just can't fix a disease with just a tablet or a pill or maybe even a surgical procedure. You may be able to, but there's going to be other factors that need to be um, uh, adhered to as well. So exercise, I mean, you you know that all too well, Shane. Um, Human body is a system of systems and you can't hide it from one by giving this pill A to take away all of the problems that were created by four or five foundations of health that are no longer there. Yeah, that's that's it. If we can get back to the pillars of health, at least as a starting point, because we don't, I've never, and this is no discredit to anyone I've seen, been asked about my pillars of health. And I'm thinking I'm going to a health professional to get advice on a symptom that might be because I'm neglecting a pillar of health. Mm -hmm. And that worries me a little bit. Of course, the wait times right now, for pr- for just to get a prescription, is two hours in a waiting room, four hours in a waiting room. Imagine if those doctors had to then also put themselves to the point where they're actually going to spend an hour with a client each time. You wouldn't be able to see doctors for, for weeks. Yeah, I get why. The system is sick. People are suffering. and people. Are, but then is there not some obligation on the government to push more education, not the bullshit propaganda money-funded uh, information that we see all around us, but real actual health and information to help then at least curve that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Won't fix it, but yeah. it will curve it. It'll curve it. And I've seen this for myself in my studies now as an exercise and sports scientist that, um, yeah, like exercise, my goodness, we've always known that it's a medicine. It's a form of medicine. Mm-hmm. And that's what I try. I'm, and I've been, you know, espousing and plugging this ever since, you know, like ever since it helped me. You know, but to actually get your own results, to, to witness your own results come true. And, it's that, and, and, and this is what, what concerns me is that the evidence, the, the, the level of evidence for this sort of stuff, for exercise when it comes to chronic diseases in particular, you know, it's a cardiovascular, diabetes, whatnot. There's a plethora of peer-reviewed solid evidence. Yep. And I still see patients who come into the clinic and say to me that, um, they might have been diagnosed with a chronic disease, but the doctor's never spoken to them about diet, exercise. It's yeah. just take this pill. Unfortunately, they don't have the time or the, the runs on the board in that area. I would not know how to diagnose drugs and therapy through drugs because I don't have the runs on the board or the, um, the knowledge. But where they need to, I think, push out that stuff is saying, okay, you know, I think it starts as the individual, like N equals one, right? Like I am my own best experiment. I need to make sure I'm looking after me and it's my obligation, not me to look around for, you know, someone to solve my problems. I've got yeah. to sometimes take that upon myself too and say, hold on, rather than pointing the finger of blame, maybe I need to turn the finger on myself and say, I can do more. I can research. I can study. I yeah. can, because I've done that. You've done that. Yep. We can do it. And so sometimes it starts there. And if you haven't done that, then, you know, you're probably wasting the time of those around you sometimes. That's right. But you're 100% right. Yeah. So that's – that, and, and that's why for me, like, adding adding this modality to my skill set is, is, is fantastic because it's something which I've already been, I guess, applying to my own, my, my own life already. But now to be able to um, pass that on even further with more evidence – to my patients or even to people who I speak to on the streets or whatever, it, it, it really uh, can make a, um, a, a massive difference because, my goodness, we, we just need to keep moving, as you said. I mean, we were given legs, we were given arms. Yep. We've got to use them. 150%. <laughs> now, Victor, yeah. I want to talk more about what you do for fun. What is it that you do to let your hair down a little bit? Oh, gosh, what's for fun? My goodness. Well... Exercise is fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be like me and sadistic and love the pleasure and the pain. <laughs> no, but it, it, it's funny though because uh, there's a there's a neuroscientist named um, Professor Andrew Huberman who I've been starting to listen to He's recently. A legend. He's a legend, right? And he talks about how you know by by you know, by looking for pleasures in the stuff that you don't like doing. So like, let's say if it's a tough workout or if it's a tough day at the office, you know, trying some way to harness your ability to gain some pleasure from that or to at least get some dopamine you produced. Reset yeah, dopamine reset. for the day, right? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, so so for me, it's like, okay, well, exercise does that. Otherwise, if, if I did my very first training with Chris for boxing back in 2005 or six and said, oh, this is too hard. I wouldn't be doing it anymore, but here I am, you know, still, <laughs> still putting myself, not, not through his boxing classes now, but uh, putting myself through similar types of training. So, um, yeah, but, yeah, just to, to, to come back to that point, yeah, I mean, 
exercise, I mean, I, I you know, like for, for me, I when I go for runs, particularly in those uh, runs in the mornings, I do tend to um, use that as a bit of a sounding board with my, you know, with, the, with my friends who I've mentioned before. Um, also, you know, on the weekends, um, in between patients, I try and, you know, watch my kids play sport. So all three of my kids are now participating in sports. So um, Charlotte plays cricket during the summer. Um, Alex plays rugby league. Um during the winter months, and uh, Felicity, my youngest, has now just started to play soccer wow. as well. So they're so you all have play- no time on the no weekends. T- no time, so they're all playing the team sport. Plus, um, Felicity also does um, fizzy as well uh, during the week. So, so yeah, so that's something I do. Um, gardening, I, I'm really enjoying gardening, uh, particularly. Well, I don't enjoy the weeding part. Bit of a Don Burke. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Green thumb and all, but that's the thing with um, gardening. Like, for me, I love growing my own veggies where I can. So, and nothing pleases me more than seeing my kids picking tomatoes or cucumbers or uh, yeah. spinach from the garden and basically enjoying eating them yeah. at dinner time. So, for me, it's like, wow, you know, like I get. Yeah, I'll get pleasure in seeing that. because Soil we've to this. plate, so to speak. And, yeah. then, and then they're going to appreciate the earth more. It's going to change. I think if more kids got involved in that, I think that would change a lot for us in the future is because now they have a connection with the soil, they have a connection with what grows from that soil, how that then creates their own cells and what that does for their bodies. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are pretty much the food that we eat, right? Yeah. So if we're eating, you know, poorly grown and farmed foods, vegetables and meats, then we're only going to be poorly we're going to have poor health. We're going to have poor health. Yeah, exactly. Because that's the thing. Like you know, as they say, we you are what you eat. So yeah, you, you eat fresh from the garden. You're going to get all those nutrients, and you're going to fortify your body with proper nutrition for better health. I always um, didn't trust myself in the garden. I think it might be safer for me to buy from it somewhere else because me in the garden uh, isn't the safest thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's frustrating. Like um, and and um, and I mean, one of my actually one of my favorite gardening achievements was to actually um, I pulled this off. Um, six months ago I was able to grow some beautiful artichokes mm. yeah so and, and and you know those who know me who see me on Facebook I've posted a lot of videos and photos of my artichokes because I'm really proud of those things um, so yeah so um, yeah it's just things like that I, I enjoy the, the gardening side of it you know I've gotten like Alex now mows the lawn for me <laughs> which is great so I've taught him to do that um, yeah kick back with my wife and listen to music now I'm not embarrassed to say this but she has gotten me into country music hey. so well that's the new <laughs> thing at the moment it's the big vibe what's that John no Hughes Humes I don't know this oh well, Luke Combs Luke maybe. Combs yeah Luke go. Combs yeah so everyone's so, talking about him everyone that wasn't into countries now or Luke Combs fan they're, they're all, in the country yeah that's it well it's funny because um, I mean she told me about Luke Combs but I actually told her about other artists like um, Jason Aldean and Luke Bryan and people like that so it was um, yeah so uh, I've got to say I, I am a converted country music fan now so that's part of my playlist um, although I still love like whenever I train like if I'm going for a run but if I'm running by myself or if I'm training by myself in the gym I always put on rock that's my yep. favorite genre of music so nothing like a bit of ACDC or yep. Airborne or um what is my other favorite band also um Five Finger Death Punch I like <laughs> them as well Parkway Drive I've been getting yep. into the local Aussie oh not the local but the Aussie band as yep. well the yep. score so it, all that sort of music that sort of not only pumps you up but also inspires you as well 100%. so that's that and then of course um yeah um I guess improving my 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 health and my mind by listening to to podcasts as well. So I try and do that People whenever I can. People first podcast. People yeah. first podcast. Absolutely, <laughs> closely followed by uh, Doctor Huberman. <laughs> yes, yes. Obviously, uh, I mean he might have a few more listeners than I do, but you know, content's the same. Only a few thousand, <laughs> <laughs> probably a million. A million. Yeah. I think I got like twelve, and he's got twelve million. Yeah. So now we've got books. I like ah. to think about some books that you would recommend to those around you or books that have left an impact on your life. Now, me personally, Paul Check, How to Eat Movie, How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy, one of my favorite books of all time that led me down the path that I've been down. Uh, but then, you know, I've got all sorts of, you know, audio books that I've l- liked over the years that have really changed my perspective on life. What would you say is a book that resonates with you? Yeah, well, there's a few, there's a couple there. Um, well, um, look, so one of my, one of my first I guess my, one of my first idols 
or one of my um, one of my first idols um, growing up was the late great Bruce Lee. Mm-hmm. So um, and you know when I first started watching him on the big screen, you know uh, watching the videos of um, of his movies. Um, loved his, just loved his his energy, and just loved his his style of martial arts. It was fantastic. But later on, I sort of looked beyond that and and read more about Bruce Lee, the man himself. Like yeah. you know, he had, and not that I'm saying I you know I have a lot of similarities to him, but you know he he moved to America. I mean, he was born in America, but then he went back to Hong Kong. But then when he uh, came back to America as a 16 or 17 year old. He was also subjected to racial, racial taunts and all yeah. that sorts and, uh, and so forth as well. Um, but he was determined uh, to make a success of himself. Um, so he started his martial arts school and um, his philosophies as well. I mean, relating you know life to 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 you know like life to things such as water. Like you know his whole be water, become my friend. Water, yeah. yeah, become yeah. Can you yeah. so if, if water like if you know if water goes like into a water. cup, it comes the cup. Yeah, you know water's seems soft but it can penetrate through rock all these sorts of things so yeah. it's like yeah that that's that's smart great. philosophies right yeah it is uh, so i read his i read his biography that his um his wife uh linda lee cadwell uh wrote um a few years after his death um and speaking of audio books there's one that i was listening to um called never split the difference uh by chris voss so he is a guy he, like he was an expert negotiator he had negotiated um in his time i can't remember how many but quite a few situations where hostages were taken um either locally in america or i, I listened um intently to a time when he was negotiating with uh, some rebels in the philippines who had taken uh, taken hostages as well, so um, so basically applying that whole area of negotiation from that extreme to just negotiating with your kids, yeah. <laughs> you know. So because obviously life's about negotiation, right? It, it, there's all, you're, you're always going to get challenged, and so it's sort of like compromising or what can we do to do this sort of thing. Um, so I read that. Um, another book I read recently was um, Riddles of the Shroud um, by. Um, Bill West, so he's a local author, or William West, and so um, it's basically a book all about uh, the shroud, the, the the cloth that Jesus was buried in, and there was always that sort of question mark as to whether or not it was authentic or was it the fake, and so basically he raised a whole lot of points about studies that had been done on the shroud um, that many scientists were in uh, involved in, and um, basically trying to answer those questions that no one can. Mm. And for me, it was sort of like, wow, like here we have scientists that are saying that, okay, this is... This can't be. This can't be tested in this way. So we had to look at other methods in terms of testing, and um, basically, a lot of things were still left unanswered. Mm. Um, so it kind of gives you a bit of a food for thought in terms of whether or not. But basically, what it was, it was it was discounting any of the fact that it was a fraud. So yeah. basically, that was discounted. So, so yeah. So it is. It is one of those mi- uh, mind opening books that you know whether you're a believer or not. It's sort of like have a read and see what you think. So that was a nice book that I read. Um, once something close to home in terms of work is a book called The End of Alzheimer's, mm-hmm. um, which is up by Dr. Dale um, Bredesen. So, um, so he talks about um, protocols and again, simple, not simple, but um, things you can do. Um, to basically help you prevent, hopefully, um, the scourge of dementia and Alzheimer's. I have heard with the dementia, um, like they're calling it at the moment, like the type 3 diabetes. Yeah. Yeah, so excessive carbohydrate consumption. Yep. Is there a premise behind that? Is it something that's covered in the book as well? Yeah, that's it. And so that's the thing. So so one of the, one of the areas is basically looking at, um, you know, your sugar intake mm. um, as such. That's why it is, it, it is sort of considered that. And, you know, in this day and age, I mean, it's, it's very easy to see how, how heavily consumed carbohydrates are. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, but that being said, it's one of many different things that are sort of contributing to that. And uh, so one of the areas of one of the areas there that I think um, can be contributing is poor microcirculation. So basically getting blood to the brain mm. because, you know, those, those little blood vessels to your brain can be a bit sluggish. So it's all like, okay, well, how can we improve that naturally? And so, um, again, one of my mentors, um, Professor Kerry Bone, came up with this um, – um, protocol on improving microcirculation, and so it was basically adding five foods to your diet. So I'm sure you probably eat 
four point five of these, Shane. But uh, the number one, uh, the first food is um, beetroot. Or Added some last night. Yep. Yeah, beetroot, <laughs> beetroot, and or green leafies, and the reason one being, from one, two from two. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And and the reason being is because they're they're high sources of nitrates, which basically help your body to produce nitric oxide. And what does that do? It widens your blood vessels, yep. especially those micro micro vessels. So that allows for better blood flow. So um, beetroot, um, cacao. So mm-hmm. pure cacao, either the, like an 85% or higher dark chocolate or just eating the pure cacao powder. I used to put that in my smoothies. Yeah, I still do that myself and I put that in my kids. So my kids have a, a smoothie, I think, four days out of seven. The problem with uh, these foods is that one person will write an article on it and then it jacks the price up 150%. Oh, you're I like, know. You're like, far out, stop. It's just, cacao is cheap as and now it's like $100 a kilo. You're like, far out, yeah. stop doing this. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that, that's it. <laughs> Always trying to make a profit. Always trying to make a profit. But yeah, so that was the second one. The third one is garlic. So having at least half or one clove of garlic a day is you're also good, good so factor. far. You're doing good so far, yeah. <laughs> and I tell people, look, if you're going to, if you can't, sort of stomach eating a, a raw garlic. You can just buy a good quality garlic supplement if you wish. Um, fourth one is berries. Yep, love berries, blueberries, su- strawberries. Oh, yeah. I still remember when you used to supply berries to me, mate, yep. all those years ago, yeah, right? Did. When you started Holistic Foundations. Coconut oil, <laughs> yeah. blueberries, uh, grass-finished meats. yeah. Uh, and free range pasture raised um, eggs. That's right, eggs. That's, that's right. It was the eggs and yep. berries you used to get for me. That's and right. I was, and I was, though very controversial, consuming most of my eggs, and I wouldn't recommend this. Don't do this at home. <laughs> most of them raw. But I did know the farmer. I knew the farm source. I knew the yeah. eggs were coming from. I was confident in the source of eggs. Everyone freaks out about salmonella. Yeah. And for good, right? Like if you don't yeah. know the, the origin of where your food comes from, then you shouldn't trust it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but that's the thing because you obviously, you know, uh, you, you, you developed a relationship with the farmer, so you trust the exactly. farmer. So, yeah, oh, yeah I'm, I'm with you on that. Absolutely. If you trust the farmer in what, he, you know, what his yeah. or hers methods mm-hmm. are for, for raising eggs or raising chickens to, make, uh, to produce the eggs, then that's great. Yep. So, yeah, so so berries uh, is the fourth one. So yeah, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, a mixture of berries, at least a hundred grams, I think. And then the fifth and final one is just the range of herbs and spices. So it can be from turmeric, cinnamon, mm-hmm. green tea. So those sorts of things. Just oh. having doesn't you don't have all of them, but so not cinnamon mention. on cinnamon donuts. Not cinnamon, saying. no, Cocaine. without the sugar. Damn. No, no, I yeah, know. Is that your is that your little vice? Is oh, it, mate? Mate, I would eat. <laughs> I would eat them lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I just love them. I know, I, and I don't eat them ever. Like obviously, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, what, if, it, I have had them, and when I do, I'm like, these are just like made from another planet, delivered to us for pure happiness. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh look, I don't think my wife would mind too much um, saying this, but uh, yeah, she's got a bit of a thing for cinnamon donuts. Oh, too. They have to be but, hot, uh, freshly cooked, though. Oh yeah, absolutely. Can't have them, and, not the ones from Coles that are in the packets that no. are there for four days before you. That's it. Well, my kids have taken. Well, actually, a couple of them. What they do now is that they butter their toast and they and they use my because the cinnamon that I buy, of course, it's the good stuff, right? Yep. So organic, all that sort of stuff. So they sprinkle the the cinnamon on and then they put a little bit of brown sugar on top, <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I say, okay, all right. And I'll, you I'll want to be me- metabolically tolerant. You don't you don't want to you omit every single thing that's bad. I mean, in any stuff like just training, like the actual act of destroying a muscle is bad. Yeah, it's. But, but that's where it stops because the body has mechanisms to deal with the trauma. That's right. And that's where the beauty is in that stress. Yeah. Same thing metabolically like some foods, although we probably should omit the hundreds of grams that people are consuming every year or month, mm. we can tolerate or learn to tolerate to a degree in some areas to make us very metabolically tolerant, you know? As opposed to being, oh, I've never eaten a peanut in my life, so now when I eat peanuts, my body freaks out, you know, or eggs or whatever it might be that we can we can perceive as bad, yeah. and become very one dimensional with our nutrition. And that's not very great either. No, that's 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 right. So that's the thing. Like, I mean, and and, and yeah. To be honest, yeah, I'm similar to you. Like, okay, we, we have our healthy meals, but I might allow, you know, maybe a couple of cheap meals a week. So what we do normally is that after we um, go to mass on a Saturday night, I say, right, kids. Right, Sarah, what are we going to have for dinner? So it will either be a choice of Chinese or, yep. or hamburgers or a pizza. Mm-hmm. So that we make that our little cheat meal and we eat that together at home. And, yep. and yeah, that's, uh, that's the things like that. I mean, if that's going to shorten your life expectancy by, you know, six months, I don't think it's going to make like it's enjoyable at the moment. You know, like it's, right, it's yeah. once every so often. That's you know, right. It's not every meal and it's not every day. And I think that's the important um, yeah, distinction. That's, that's exactly right. So, um, yeah. And oh, I forgot to mention as all well, the other... Yeah, um, uh, 
one, one of the other audio books I, I just listened to recently, which I loved, was um, the autobiography of Ralph Macchio from uh, Karate Kid. Yes. The, the Karate Kid. So it's called Waxing On. Yes. So uh, I enjoyed listening to that. Yeah, the original one. So yep. uh, it was another book too. So um, yeah. So but, and, and that's basically where I, I, I pick up more information, like in general, like with the Alzheimer's book by Dr. Dale and, and um, apply that where I can to my own life as well. Because I have had family members who are, you know, had dementia and some that are now starting to exhibit symptoms of dementia. Yeah. So for me, it's that... Start now. Like, yep. start looking after yourself now. 100%. Yeah. Now, before the camera cuts off, because it's flashing at me oh, with a yes, red battery. That's all right. What is your message to the world, Victor? You've got to, if you could tap in everyone's brain right now, I pushed a button and everyone could hear you speak in their yeah. own minds, what would you leave as a message to the world? Yeah, two things. Please look after your health, okay? Whatever you can do to look after your health, please do what it takes. Get advice. Just look after your health. And the other thing is always look for new challenges because new challenges will just basically inspire you. Once you, once you complete one challenge, look for another. Keep on improving yourself that way because I found in me personally when – I'm looking for new challenges. I'm continuously uh, inspired to to go on and to try and complete the challenge. Or I'm not after first place, particularly if I'm doing a Spartan race. I'll never get to first place. Don't worry about that. But I just want to get through it. So for me, look for challenges, new challenges, and please look after your health. Amazing words of wisdom from the man himself. Victor, thank you so much for staying with us today, Victor. Thank you for coming down and spending an hour and a half of your time <laughs> helping those people understand the beauty of health, life, loss, and love. We've had it all in this story. It has really inspired me. I hope that the people listening have got something out of it, and I hope that you've enjoyed telling your story. Absolutely. Thanks, Shane. Thanks again for, uh, for, for your support over the years, and uh, yeah, yeah. I um, hope everyone enjoys, the, uh, enjoys my story. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. And until next time, keep on going to the gym and I hopefully will see you in the gym. Have a good one, guys. See you later.